You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Very, we had a, a great service ahead. We are going to be uh, coming to the Lord's table. We've got a bunch of students that are heading out on a mission trip this week. We'll be praying for at the end of the service. But now uh, I'm going to be talking about salt and light. But to, to, to set that up, because I am over the age of 40, I still go on Facebook occasionally. Those of you under the age of 40, Thank you for kind of clearing the deck for us. Uh, you know, lots of room now for us to get around in Facebook now that you've all left. But I do occasionally go on Facebook and uh, I saw, not always great stuff on there, but I saw a post recently that uh, I want to start with. It was from a friend of mine who, uh, a woman named Taniko, who used to be an intern at our Highland Park campus and she got her MDiv from Trinity and she now works as a teacher at a prison. And here's the story that she told. She says, I'm at the prison, sitting in my classroom, waiting for my participant to come for his one-on-one -on -one meeting. And then this happens. A random offender, not one of my clients, comes in my classroom and closes the door. I've never met or seen this gentleman before today. This is an absolute no-no, especially when there is not a corrections officer present to observe. Well, before I can say a word, he says, can you please, please pray for me? I'm going through a lot. She says, sure, I'll pray for you, but how did you know that I pray? And he says, your spirit came in this hell out of the blue. I know that you're a prayer person. And then she says, I was speechless. My clients don't even know I'm a minister and intercessor. The light truly can't be hidden even in the darkest places. Well, I think this is the perfect story to introduce our passage today. Uh, the, this next passage up in this most famous of sermons that we are just kind of skipping along. We're not, we're not looking at every passage. Last week, Mike talked about from the first, the Beatitudes, who's blessed in the world. It's not the group that's usually considered blessed, not the most beautiful, the most successful, but rather it's the humble, it's the mourners, it's the spiritually dependent. And he tells that group of people, those people there, and then by extension, us, that they, that we, are salt and light. And we're going to see that when Jesus says that we're salt, what he's saying is that we are to be set apart. And when he says that we're light, he's saying that we are to be transparent and not hide. So let's look at each of those nouns. First, what does salt do? Well, salt does a lot of things, but I think what, what Jesus might have been referring to is that salt flavors, it preserves and it causes thirst. We're going to look at each of those. How might uh, salt flavor? How, how, what, what does it mean that we could be salt that flavors? Well, what happens to a bland food when you put salt on it? It's actually surprising when you think about it, because if, if you were to just taste salt by itself, if someone was like, here's a teaspoon of salt, taste it, you would say, that's disgusting. And then they would say, no, no, put it on your food. And you would say, why do you hate me? That's going to make my food taste like that disgusting thing. And they would say, no, no, hang on, just a little bit. If you put a little bit of that, the right amount onto your food, that bland food, the flavor that's inside of it actually comes out, right? So the essence of the food comes out. We have that ability to do that to the world around us, to bring out the essence of people. That's what happens when people put their faith in Jesus. C.S. Lewis makes this point in mere Christianity. He says, how monotonously alike all the great tyrants have been, how gloriously different are all the saints. The more a person comes to know God, the more they become themselves. And we can bring the best out of the people that we're around. It's, an, it's such an honor to do that. Eugene Peterson, in his translation of this passage, he says, you are here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors 
of the earth. We can be part of drawing people out the way God made them to be. So that's flavoring. Secondly, we can preserve. So before uh, refrigerators, if you wanted some meat to not go bad, you could uh, soak it in salt water and it, it, it would last longer. So think about like beef jerky. That's the process that, that beef jerky goes through. And that's potentially the thing that people most would have thought about when he said salt. We can bring preservation to those around us. Think about it this way. If God wants the sun to shine on one person on a given day, everyone around that person gets blessed. You may not realize this, but just as salt prevents meat from decaying, so you have the power just by being yourself to slow the moral decay that is happening around you. Most of the time, you won't even know that it's happening. It just happens by you putting yourself in situations where your life is intersecting with the life of someone who is far from God. So that's flavoring, it's preserving, and then finally causing thirst. In the same way that salt can can make someone want water, the way we live our lives can cause people to long for God. Again, as we intersect with people who don't know Jesus, we can cause others to thirst for him. They, They might see that we look different, that there's a joy, a resolve in our hearts to live for God. Some will have no choice but to say, you know what, I I never realized this, but I'm thirsty, I need a drink of that water that will never run dry. It's it's the same idea as you go into a, you know, movie theaters have figured this out. You go into a movie theater, you didn't even know you were hungry, you didn't even know you wanted popcorn, all of a sudden, I gotta give me some of that popcorn. It's the, the smell that's in the air that makes you say, I would like some of that. So, Just as salt flavors, preserves, causes thirst, we flavor our world, we preserve our world, we cause those who don't know God to thirst for him. But how? Well, Jesus says that there's something that must be different about this salt. The salt has to be salty, he says. And if it's lost its saltiness, it's useless. So we have to be the kinds of followers that retain the qualities of saltiness. That is, we have to be different. We have to be distinctive. We have to be set apart. You could use the word holy here. I'm trying to avoid using that word holy because when people think of the word holy, they think that that means perfection and and, and sinlessness. That that is not what we will ever be able to do. There's only one sinless person. God made him, the scriptures say, that had no sin to be sin for us. But we are to be different. We are to be set apart, which is actually probably a better translation for the word holy. Just a, a set apart ones is another word for a holy, holy ones. We have to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, as James 1 says. And we lose our impact on the world. Jesus says we're no good, we're no good for anything if we're not willing to be salty Christians. That is, Christians who are willing to make the hard choices in order to be set apart for God. Now, a skeptic at this point would say, okay, yeah, so now's the time when you tell us that you have to, you know, just just be good all the time. Well, no, I'm not saying you have to be good all the time. It's simply a matter of saying your life has to look different from the lives of the world around you. But it's important to understand why we are called to this set-apart life. We are called to this set-apart life not for our own good, We are called to this set-apart life for the good of others. People that pursue holiness for the sake of themselves, those people 2,000 years ago were called Pharisees. Today, they would just be called self-righteous people. Jesus didn't have nice things to say about the Pharisees. He wasn't indifferent to them. He called them vipers. He called them whitewashed tombs. His call to be holy has to do with his heart for people who are not in his family right now for people outside the church. Holiness is important because there's, there's a, actually a word for those who are uh, religious people that aren't set apart, and that word is hypocrite, right? Someone who says that they are but doesn't reflect that by their actions. And the biggest turnoff to an outsider is a hypocrite. And, you know, our differentness as Christians has made an impact on the world around from the beginning. I was reading a a book recently that quotes a historian of early Christianity who makes the claim that the primary reason Christianity 
won over the Roman Empire in only a few centuries was not its relevance or its relatability, but it, it was its differentness, its distinctiveness. It's an apologetic of actions that speak louder than words. I also want to say that we're not supposed to do this on our own power either. That, that would be legalism. But rather, through the power of the Holy Spirit, followers of Jesus are to be committed to being set apart, different, not perfect, but ready, surrendered so that God might use us to look different, to stand out from the world. We have an, it's an incredible honor to, to flavor, to preserve, to, to cause thirst, but it, it only works if we're committed to this, this kind of set apart life. So that's salt. Then what do we move on to next? Jesus compares us to, he says that we are light. So what does light do? It, it shines, it welcomes, it warms, it brightens, it, it brings hope. It's that thing that Taniko does in her prison. It just, it just shines. In today's world too, we, we, don't, we don't think much about light. We just sort of go, yeah, you know, we, we got, our, our houses have windows and, and skylights. We don't think about it. At night, if, you, if it's dark, you turn the light on. Well, when, as Jesus is talking about light, uh, when it gets dark 2,000 years ago, you, you have to physically light something that is a flame in your home that potentially could burn the house down. Like, they would understand this idea of light coming into a dark place and making a difference. So this, this metaphor of a light on a lampstand that gives light to a dark house, they, they, would, they would be tracking with that. And then Jesus uses a, a similar metaphor. He says, a city on a hill or a town on a hill cannot be hidden. And he is carrying on this, this theme that starts way back in the Old Testament where God told Abraham that in him all the families of the earth will be blessed. He told Moses, out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. He tells Isaiah, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Again, he's saying the light I'm calling you to be is not primarily for you. It is for everyone around you so that they might see God. Some of you know this if you've been around the church a while, but we have a, a, a bell at the top of that tower. It rings uh, at 9 and 11 every Sunday morning. And on that bell, there is a verse inscribed on the bell. And the verse that is inscribed on that bell, you can see a picture here. There's the bell at the top of the bell tower. And if you look a little bit closer, it's, it's this verse here. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. That's the verse, the early, the, the folks that founded this church, that was the verse that they sort of felt like God was calling them to be. And so they put that on the bell. And it's one of the reasons why I love that bell tower, because if you think about it, the bell tower doesn't have any functional purpose to it. It's just, it's just there to look pretty. And the story goes, actually, when they, when they built this initially, so in the late 80s, the, the plan was to have all these different buildings, but they said, we're going to start with the sanctuary and the B building and the bell tower. And then when it came time to build the bell tower, they were, they were out of money. And so they said to the city, hey, we're going to wait on the bell tower. And the city said, no, you're not. If you want to, if you want to go in that church, you got to build the bell tower. And they actually said, because otherwise it'll look like a restaurant. And they said, well, that is a really big restaurant. Uh, but they kind of had a point, right? If, if, if there's no bell tower, it just kind of looks like a big house and a little bit smaller house. You put that tower there and everyone goes, ah, oh, yeah, it's a church. And how many people throughout the years, it's a lot that would say, how did you come to Christ Church? Oh, I just drove by and it was just, it's beautiful. It's such a beautiful building. I decided to stop in. The beauty of that tower points people to God, physically actually. It points people to God. And that's our call as well, to be that city that can, can't help it, but to shine and to call other people to God. We are to be that city on a hill. Sometimes though, it's easy to want to hide. You might find yourself in a situation where people start critiquing religious people, or they start asking hard theological questions that you don't know the answer to. 
and you're not sure how to shine your light in that situation. I actually think that shining your light is probably easier than you think it is. It's simply a matter of not hiding what Jesus is doing. That's what he's calling you to. I think that is the, the core of what it means to be light, is to be transparent, to not hide what God is doing. Remember, Jesus says that we're not to hide our light under a basket. And, and, and the thing is, a light doesn't do much. It allows what it is to be seen. So just being willing to share with people when the situation is right, how you feel about your faith, what you do on Sundays. If God is, is, is answering a prayer in your life, to just say that, to say, yeah, you know, God's at work in my life. I remember a moment from my life, uh, probably about 15 years ago now, when I, was, I, I did a play. Uh, a friend of mine was directing this play, and I, and I was able to be a part of it down in Chicago, and the, the subject matter of the play was actually all about Jesus. I played Jesus, and there were, Judas was in it, and a bunch of other biblical characters. I was the only Christian involved in this play. But the subject matter was such, it was actually uh, written initially, a few years before that, uh, a Catholic priest in New York helped to, to write the play. The, the, the subject matter was, was very, very religious, a lot of biblical themes. And so the director, my friend, said, well, why don't we all just go around and have everyone talk about their experiences with the Bible, with Christianity, because of what we were talking about. I think I went last, and as they went around the room, uh, person after person said, well, yeah, I knew this guy, and you know, he said he was a Christian, but he was kind of a jerk, and I, I didn't like him. And another person, oh, I went to this it's a Jewish woman. I went to this Christian school and the, the teacher there kind of outed me as a Jewish person and made me feel terrible. And another guy was like, yeah, this friend invited me to, he said it was going to be a party. And then an ins inspirational, a motivational speaker got up and started sharing. And I was like, oh no, that was a youth pastor. That was definitely a youth pastor. <laughs> the classic bait and switch. No, no, come to a party. All right, now we're going to preach at you, you know? And so it came, it came to me and I, I really, I just sort of wanted to crawl under the table. So that's what I said. I said, guys, I am so sorry to hear that you've had these terrible experiences. I, 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 it's terrible to hear that. All I can say is that I started going to ch church as a, as a kid and I was kind of indifferent to it, but I, I met people whose lives were changed by their faith. And then I had experiences with God that now I just, you know, I, Jesus changed my life. And I believe that the, the, the Bible's true. And so that's how I live my life. Nothing happened in that moment. Uh, you know, there, 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 was, there was no dramatic conversions. And in fact, no one that I know of in that play necessarily had a dramatic conversion at any point. But at the very least, everyone in that room could at least have one person that they now knew as g going forward that they could say, well, there was that one Christian guy that I met who wasn't a total jerk, right? It was important, of course, that I be salt, that I'd be set apart. Like I had to live my life in such a way that what I was saying was true about me came out in my actions. So that was, that was very important. But I also then had to take the opportunity to shine my light. I also remember seeing this model at a, at a really tough time in my life. I was in the room at a time when a doctor was sharing some very bad news about a loved one. The prognos prognosis was, was not good at all. And the doctor said something like, at this point, there is nothing we can do. This is before I was a pastor, I was very despondent. And an older gentleman in the room, extended family member, spoke up in that moment and he said, that's not true, doctor, we can pray. And it was a powerful moment. He wasn't being, he wasn't grandstanding, he wasn't being showy, he was, it was just the natural thing that came out of him in that moment that he felt like he wanted to share. And the doctor said, my apologies, you're right. You can and you should pray. It changed the temperature of the room. It was just this natural thing that this man of faith, the light just, it just came out of him in that dark place. Now there are times when this isn't done well. There's another side to being salt and light. We can be salt that burns and we can be light that blinds can't we? So we can be uh, in your face, Christians. We, we can always be bringing up spiritual things. We can be that person who is just always wanting to spiritualize everything. 
And we have to learn, I, there was certainly a time in my life when I was guilty of this, and I had to learn and mature and realize there's a time to, to just be quiet, and there's a time to speak up. And like I've said before, uh, we can be hypocritical Christians. We can preach one thing, practice another. There is no greater turnoff than if you are not living out your faith. But this brings us to the final verse. What Jesus says in verse 16, when we are salt set apart and when we are light, not hiding what God is doing, verse 16 says that people far from God know him. In the same way, Jesus says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven, which is amazing to consider. Jesus doesn't say when you present a perfectly reasoned, persuasive argument, or when you have the precisely worded gospel presentation just right. Nothing wrong with those things, but what Jesus says in this context is, when your light shines before others, they see your good deeds, and they glorify God. It draws people to God. So you've heard this passage read, you've heard me talk about it, and yet, some of us, and that's certainly been, been true in my life in the past, some of us don't want to live like this. We, we live our lives as though the passage said the opposite, actually. Uh, we live our lives as though Matthew 5 says, instead, Jesus found the best and the brightest, and he dubbed them the frozen chosen, and he took them away so that he might be with them and so that he could teach them to live not in the world and also as far away from the big bad world as they could possibly get. He said to them, you are the salt of the earth. And you know how salt works? It, it, it works best when it stays with the rest of the salt and the salt shaker next to its friend the pepper right on the table. Just, just leave it there nice and safe. He said to them, you are the light of the world. And light is made to be hidden away because what would happen if someone came along to blow it out? It must be preserved away, safe. He said to them, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. It's beautiful, isn't it? So let's make sure we put a gate around the city so that only the people who deserve to be here are here. It's a lot easier to run away, to retreat, to get away from the difficult things in, world, in the world and find a safe place. That's not what salt does. It is made to leave the salt shaker. And that's not what light does. Light is made to shine. I heard from a friend recently, uh, a family that was going through a, a tough situation. The, uh, the husband had a lot of conflict at work. Difficult situations kept happening to them. And their feeling was, you know what? We, we have had enough. We have had enough conflict in our lives. We got to get out of here. We got to go. We got to move somewhere where our situation is going to be easier. And the more they thought about it and began to pray about it, uh, the mom in the family, she actually felt like God was speaking to her. And what she felt like God was saying to her was, I am not calling you to leave. I'm calling you to lead. And her response was, no, 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 no. No, you got, you got the wrong person. That, no, no, not me. I'm, I'm, th this is so hard. Are you kidding me? I'm not supposed to lead. Come on, please. I want the easy way out. And the more they began to pray and, and lean into God, the more they realized, oh, actually, this is exactly where God wants us. And she said to me recently, she said, you know, I, I believe this, I think it's true, she said, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. So their family said, we're going to be recommitted. We're recommitted to our, our neighborhood, our friends, our community. Now, that's not to say that in every difficult situation, everyone is always called to stay. Everyone has to reach out to God, pray about what God is calling to them to. I would say again, the same thing is true, that uh, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. But our impulse is often to, to, to hide, to run away, to retreat. It's easier to stay in the salt shaker. But the path forward for us, for us I think, is found in these four verses. Now is not the time for us as Christians to run away and hide. Now is not the time for us as Christians to fight and always try to win for our side. Rather, the path forward is for us to engage with and in so doing, impact the culture around us. 
to be set apart salt, to be shining lights, and that requires a couple of pretty simple things. First, we gather. A single grain of salt doesn't do a whole lot of good. We need to gather together first, commit to gathering together for weekly worship services, to gather together in small groups, and then, once we've gathered, then to scatter. Salt was not made to stay in the shaker. It was made to go into the food, to make an impact. Light wasn't made to be hidden. It was made to shine. Now, how have I seen this, this played out? I, I think there are a few examples I could look to in the, in the world around me, uh, people that I read about, people that I, that I don't necessarily know. So uh, I've seen this played out in the arts. And a number, some of these names I'm going to mention, depending on who, you may say, well, I read this one article where he said this, and I don't know if he's a Christian. You know, so take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt, pun intended. Um, but for me, big fan of the, of the band U2. Many people know that. And Bono, the lead singer, I, I am inspired by the way this guy has, has taken his faith and integrated it into his incredible gift of making music. I, I see that as well in, in the music for a younger generation of Justin Bieber. The guy has clearly been transformed by his faith and, and uh, he, he chooses different avenues to share that faith with others in the platform that he's been given. Filmmaker like Terrence Malick, who makes some of the, the greatest movies in the world, there is something going on with this guy's faith and it comes out in his work. In medicine, a scientist like Francis Collins, who is at the top of his field and yet also an outspoken Christ follower. We see this a lot, of course, in sports and there's a number of people. You see a coach like Tony Dun Dungy who uh, is, you know, won a Super Bowl, is, is so well-respected and yet is quite clear about his love for Christ. Tons of athletes, probably the most prominent is Tim Tebow, but close to home, all three of the Bears quarterbacks last year were quite clear about their, their faith, outspoken about their faith. And Nick Foles, when he won the Super Bowl a number of years ago, he said after he won the Super Bowl that after he was done playing, he was interested in doing youth ministry because of the impact it made on his life. The offer stands, Nick. We can have, and there's an internship here for you. It's unpaid, but uh, we'd be willing to find a spot for you as an internship with you. Um, in media, Chip and Joanna Gaines uh, have, God has <laughs> tremendously blessed what they have been doing. They have their own network now. There's a lot of things happening. You, you have to work really hard to find someone who has negative things to say about them. They are, they are living their faith out in what God has given them. In the workplace, uh, you know, we, we could set up a mic here, and, and, and I'm sure there's a ton of people in your own industries that can talk about how your faith is making an impact in your world. I think about a, a grocery store in my home state of Texas called HEB, uh, started by a Christian family, you know, 100 years ago, and they actually started a camp where I went to as a kid, came to faith there. But their faith makes a difference in how they run their business. And as a result, people love what they do. So just an example, last year there was a big freeze in Texas, and people were gassing up their cars, and they were running out of gas. And so only at some of the, some of the stations that they had, only the premium unleaded was left over. And they said, well, we're only going to charge people regular for the premium unleaded. They didn't have to do that, but they did it. Another story of a guy who was filling up, people are going to the store, filling up their carts because they don't know how long they're going to be out. And the power goes out in the store and he is at the back. He told this story on Facebook, the post went viral, but he's at the back of the store. He doesn't know how long he's going to be there. And all of a sudden the line starts moving and he's like, how are they checking people out? What are they, how is this going so fast? He gets to the front of the line and the person there is just waving him through, just like, keep on moving. And he, he's like, well, how, how what, what do you mean? I, I can write down what I got and I can pay you later. And they're like, no, 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 keep going. Just, just, you know, God bless you. And of course, what an impact that made. People that choose to take their values and live those out, that is a shining light the world desperately needs. Excuse me one moment. Getting out of control here. All right. Um, I think about closer to home, our own David Weil, who was my boss here for about 10 years, and he now leads our efforts in North Chicago with Renew Communities. Um, 
he felt God, he and his wife Susie felt God calling them to move to the community of North Chicago. And that when they moved into their house, he was looking at his house one day and it's, it's built up on a hill. And he felt like uh, God was saying to him, that's exactly, that's right. And you are to be that shining light. And as they began to get this idea for the homes that they were going to rehab and to build in North Chicago and this vision of each of those homes being a shining light, he said, well, maybe we should call them Matthew homes. And, and so they did, and so they do. And it's based on this verse, this idea that each of those homes is to be a city on a hill shining into their communities. One other example, uh, closer to home as well, relates to uh, something that I, I went to see my daughter in a play at uh, Lake Forest High School a couple months ago. And the tradition now at the plays is that everybody involved in the play, cast and crew, has a photo and an envelope underneath, and they have note cards out. And every, anybody that wants to, fellow cast members or anybody coming to see the shows, can write a note of encouragement and put it on there. And the reason why they have that tradition is because the youth group, even before I started here, had a tradition on the mission trips uh, that they would have an encouragement board. And in fact, when we leave Tuesday to go to the Dominican Republic, 36 of us, we will have uh, envelopes with everyone's name on it. And throughout the trip, people will write notes of encouragement. And a student, maybe five or six years ago, came back from a mission trip and was in a play and came to the, to the director and said, hey, we do this thing at my youth group. Could we have an encouragement board? So that started out just, just internally. And then later it, it expanded to having the entire community able to encourage one another. So it's taking something that's a blessing in the church and then shining that light into the world around you. I heard a story just this morning that I was so excited to hear and I wanted to share it, that a woman in our congregation who joined a book group and she just joined a book group. She didn't have an agenda. Somebody invited her into a book group. Now, it turns out she was the only person of faith in that group. And through her involvement, without having an agenda, one person in that group had a radical transformation, came to Christ, and her husband eventually as well. It is surprising sometimes what God can do in and through us, if we will just be willing to be shining lights and even to come in without an agenda and just say, okay, I'm just gonna put my life in an intersection with someone who is far from God and God, see what you do. This is what we're called to and it's not always safe. It's sometimes dangerous in fact, but faith isn't supposed to be safe. I will close with this, a friend of mine, Justin McRoberts, is a songwriter, and I think my favorite song of his is called Safe. And I'm gonna read you the lyrics here, and if you wanna look it up later, you, you, you can look it up, but his name's Justin McRoberts, the song is called Safe. But here, here's the lyrics. It's, he says, he's commenting on how Christians can sometimes be. And he says, it's safe for everyone. Clean jokes and cleaner fun. Come bring the kids and wife. Stay safe and stay alive. And then he says, we'll close and lock the doors to keep the bad ones out. That's how we'll show them just how good it is inside the house. Well, they'd hurt our young. They'd steal our time. They'd eat our bread and drink our wine. It's safe and quiet now, far from the seething crowds who clamor for what they deserve. Those sinners sure do have some nerve We've earned our right to live in peace by choosing Christ and living quietly. And then he closes the song talking about himself. He says, a thousand times I'd rather fall than be afraid to move at all. And then the closing line, he says, after all, what is this thing that you call grace? Is it safe? Grace is not safe. Jesus' willingness to leave the comforts of heaven wasn't safe. He knew he was going to experience rejection. He knew he would be asked to bear the weight of humanity. It was costly, but it was worth it. He is our example in this, isn't he? He is our great light. He calls us to shine his light to the world around us. And we can follow him in that. And as we turn our attention to the table, he is 
our example in what leaving safety can do, the fruit of that. And so we turn our attention to that now. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, as Philippians says, you did not play it safe. You followed the call on your life to the cross. And so we come to meet with you now to find spiritual nourishment in this moment and in this time. We pray in your name, amen.